Welcome to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, if you've been following the series, you'll know that the time before the last session, Corinthians 8 and 10 were done at the same time in the talk, but due to the magic of television, we've split them up again. So what you could do, if you've got time, is to revisit 1 Corinthians 8 in the talks, or perhaps just fast forward for the last few minutes to see if there is any interconnecting themes, which there are. Or perhaps, if you haven't got time for that, just read 1 Corinthians 8, and then we're going to get into 1 Corinthians 10 any minute now. I hope that makes sense. I mean, to be honest, I'm a bit confused myself. But anyway, let's take a look at what Paul says. Remember our history, friends, Paul says in 10, 1 Corinthians 10. Our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken through the Red Sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours, and Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. They ate and drank identical food and drink meals provided by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain, that saved them. And then he goes on to say that rock was Christ. But just experiencing God's wonder and grace didn't seem to mean much. Most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert. The same thing could happen to us. We must be on our guard that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. We mustn't turn our religion into a circus as they did. We must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving him. They're warning markers in our history because, I'm jumping through verses here, No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He will never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. I'm assuming I'm addressing believers who are mature. Draw your own conclusions. When we drink from the cup, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the life of Christ? isn't the same with a loaf of bread. And he says, do you see the difference? Sacrifices offered to idols and offered to nothing. For what's the idol but a nothing? Or worse than nothing, it's a minus. He says, it's a demon. And I don't want you to become part of something that reduces you to less than yourself. And you can't have it both ways, banqueting with the master one day and slumming it with demons the next. He wants us all or nothing. Looking at, looking at it one way, you could say anything goes because of God's immense generosity and grace. We don't have to dissect and scrutinise every action to see if it will pass muster. But the point is not just to get by. We want to live well. But our foremost efforts should be to let others, to help others live well. Eat your meals heartily. Not worrying about what others say about you. You're eating to God's glory after all, not to please them. As a matter of fact, do everything that way, heartily and freely to God's glory. And here we go. Here's his second point. At the same time, don't be callous in your exercise of freedom, thoughtlessly stepping on the toes of those who aren't as free as you are. I try my best to be considerate of everyone's feelings in these matters, and I hope you will too. So it's two chapters making the same two points, which is nice because it makes for a shorter sermon. Firstly, or rather secondly, because I'm going to take Paul's points in reverse order. Respect other people, he says. This is the point. You worry about all this stuff, but actually you should only worry about it if it's going to affect other people. Be careful. Be compassionate. If someone has a weakness or a vulnerability, don't Don't be inconsiderate of them. Another example, don't take an alcoholic to the pub. If someone's an ex-smoker, don't let smoke in front of them. Be considerate of the things that other people are facing. Don't encourage people to wander off pathways they don't want to go down. Be careful of one another. But secondly, or firstly in his order... Don't be afraid of these things. This is growing in faith, knowing that you can do anything, but choosing not to do it. Knowing that everything is permitted in as much as there aren't millions of rules that say every single thing you can and cannot do. But with some churches, it's everything you cannot do. There's one rule. 
And that one rule is love. We know it. We talked about it the other week. In fact, we should talk about it every week. Obey that and everything else falls into place. Should I do that? Well, will it hurt other people? Will it hurt me? Then I'm not going to do it. These other things. These other things. You don't need to fear them. Don't fear the tarot. Don't fear other faiths. Don't fear astrology. Don't fear demons. Don't fear horror films. All that stuff. Don't go looking for it. I don't watch horror films. And it's not on any moral principle. I know it's because it upsets me. <laughs> I get scared. So I don't watch them. And if, if people ask me to watch them, I'd rather they didn't. I have to say, no, I don't want to do it. It's too upsetting. Throws me off kilter. So don't put yourself in harm's way. And don't put others in harm's way. But above all, don't be afraid. Because do you see, says Paul, do you see? It has no power. It's nothing. Or to use the, the translation or the words of the message, it's less than nothing. There is one God. No one is fighting with God. I know there is imagery in the Bible about the war between heaven and hell or, or against with the angels, the angels that follow God. And then the, the other side, there's this imagery of that. But they're not going to win. They've already lost. We know that love wins. We know no one else is going to win. God wins. Love wins. Jesus wins. We saw it in his life, in his death and in his resurrection. We know it in our lives now. There are temporal powers, yes. There's Putin. There's governments. There's gas and electric companies. There's tax breaks for the rich. There are things that will threaten and destroy us. And they can hurt us. They can hurt the body. But they cannot hurt the soul. Only if we let them. And even, even after they've done their worst, God will still win. Because empires will rise and fall. We use some words from actually from Saxon times, so that's not a thousand plus years old, where it talks about still the rampart crumbles. People had seen these great buildings that had been built by civilizations before them in this country, and they saw they were just crumbling away. Those, those empires that people think, this is all powerful, I am all powerful, we are mighty, they crumble away. But you know what's remained? The truth of God and the truth of love and the power of those empires rise and fall bullies rise and fall but God is eternal it may seem that death is one we know Good Friday don't we heaven's sakes we know Good Friday in our lives it may seem that death has won but it hasn't and we as God's people will defy it so don't be afraid. God is one. If people are worshipping God, they're worshipping the one God. God is all. This other stuff, it can't really hurt you. It can damage you. So be careful. Be careful. Don't be less than you are. But know that God is one. Have the strength, the maturity to say, well, actually, no, I don't need that. And respect and love others too. Don't do anything that might lead them astray or cause them to stumble. Don't do that. Do stuff that builds you and builds others. So those two chapters, I, I would urge you, I often urge you, don't I, to read again 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. We'll come back to 9 later. If you want to sum it up in a, a couple of phrases, Firstly, says Paul, be careful. Be careful what you do and who you do it with. And secondly, he says, don't be afraid because God is one. God is all. 
And God will always, always surround and protect you. So God bless you. May you know God's shielding on every side. And be blessed in the knowledge that he holds you. And walk in his ways. And encourage those around you to do the same. Amen.